Well, hello to you all, and thank you for joining us tonight as we continue the prophecies. Uh, this tonight's session is concerning the Messiah. Now, after Jesus was risen from the dead, there were many discussions as to what had happened to him. And uh, this was unbelievable that someone could actually be alive after so many had seen him die. Jesus himself appears to have many of the believers, appears himself to many of the believers after his resurrection to, to confirm to them that he was in fact alive. Notice on the screen there, the passage that we brought up, this is um, uh, to answer some of the things that these two men along this roadway were discussing. Jesus joins them, and when they, he realizes what they're talking about, he answers them, and he says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. So what that's telling us is that all of the Bible, including the Old Testament, has passages that refer to the Messiah, and in particular, uh, that confirm that Jesus Christ is the Messiah once we come to the New Testament. So beginning with these things, John's going to explain some of those things to us tonight. We're going to look at the prophecies about the coming Messiah, which we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we begin, please join me as we open tonight with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we approach before your throne of grace, thankful for all that you have revealed in your word and for the hope it provides to us of a coming salvation. We realize the earth is in turmoil among the nations, the ravages of this sickness and disease that is passing through the world and the anxiety it's causing in the hearts of many, but you provide for us a steadfast hope and a renewable faith that we can be encouraged in and that we can stir up one another by the reading of your word, such as we are doing tonight. So please give us strength and help us in our understanding and increase our faith as we look to these things and look to the signs that you have provided to help us in our faith. We pray that you will bless us this night and that you will hear the words that are presented, that they may be favorable in your sight. And we ask that you will hear us in all that we ask, for we ask it in the name of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we mentioned tonight, we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 9. John's with us tonight to share some of these passages that refer to uh, Jesus. And a lot of these verses, especially in Isaiah, were written hundreds of years before Jesus was actually born. So to introduce his subject for tonight, we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. And some of you might actually recognize these passages from Handel's Messiah. So Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as such was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, they that dwell in the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. The joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and the garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel with fire of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So these are some of the topics that we're going to consider tonight. We should note that from the outset, when we talk about the prophecies of the Messiah, um, we should consider them in the light of the work that he's called by God to do. The first advent, as we see on the screen here, or the first coming of the Messiah, was to provide an offering for sin on behalf of the believers. 
If you read, and many of us will remember from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So other prophecies, though, they refer to his second coming or his second advent. And the Christians are now waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the topics that we're going to look at tonight that John's going to share with us. So let's get started. We're going to turn it over to John, who will share with us several scriptural prophecies concerning the Messiah. John. Okay. All good. Can you see it? Can do. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. So this passage that uh, Bill's already read, I was just reading uh, this one verse more uh, again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And that's from Isaiah 9 and 6. So if these sound familiar, uh, they, they should be, because at this time of year, throughout the Christian world, the presentation uh, of a choir, an orchestra, is uh, done. And of course, as Bill has already mentioned in his opening remarks, was that of Handel's Messiah. So on April 13th in 1742, there was a great musical oratorio was presented for the first time and conducted by the composer himself, that being George Hendrik Handel. There's a number of interesting things about this presentation uh, that is very, I guess, useful for, for us as we're trying to understand and learn to read the Bible. And, as we've uh, done in other seminars, such as learn to learn and read the Bible effectively seminar, we try to use some of the tips and tools as we go through that. And, I, and I'll attempt to do that as we go through it. And uh, you might want to uh, have a pen and paper handy to jot some of these verses down because we have no manual for these uh, four presentations. Uh, one that we had last week with uh, Skip and myself tonight, and then there's two more uh, in the new year, early in the new year. So it might be useful to jot some of these down and then you can look at them later. So as we're considering this uh, presentation, this oratorio, as I said, the words are quoted directly from the scriptures of truth, from numerous passages of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that's significant. So it's not uh, other men's uh, words that have reinterpreted what it's saying and put it to a musical score. He has taken the actual words right out of the Bible and uh, put his music to it. And um, so Handel worked at great speed and the whole oratorial was sketched and scored over a three week period. I can't imagine doing that. I don't think I could have got the first line. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, almost overnight, he became a box office sensation, delighting scores of people. And ever since, it has become a tradition for it to be presented by orchestras and choirs around the world at this time of the year. And so it, it's a wonderful thing. You can go on. If you have access to uh, YouTube, which probably most of us do, you can go on. And there's many presentations of this. And uh, you can hear it and see it. And, and again, what's significant is the, they're using the words of the, uh, the Bible in the words that they sing. So just uh, kind of sketching out what he covers, the oratorial aims to present an outline of life and mission of the Lord Jesus Christ taken completely from Scripture. For all the words sung during the piece are taken from the Bible. And I know I've said that a couple of times, but it, it's... Um, effective, I guess. It starts with some of the passage proclaiming the coming of the Messiah uh, from his birth, the Jewish rejection, and his teaching. It covers the death on the cross, his ascension into heaven, 
and the proclamation of the gospel unto all nations. Lastly, it covers his second coming or advent as Bill has introduced us to uh, and establishment of the kingdom. The oratorio shows us the two advents or comings of Christ, first as the Lamb of God and second as the King of the world. Now, though, again, those two things are significant. There's two roles in which he, which he did when he came. The first time he came as the Lamb of God and he, he did many things. He started his teaching. He, he uh, showed forth many principles which we base our life upon and then when he comes the second time or the second advent uh, he comes as the king of the world and so prophecies uh, working out with us okay so I just would like to first of all go through the great promises that we've we've talked about a number of times uh, but they're useful when we're considering the prophecy of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, both in the first and second advent. So the first one was the Adamic promise, and that was occurs in Genesis 3 and 15. And that's where we have that interchange uh, between God and the serpent and uh, Eve. And they're there, and, and you see the things that went on there. But in there, is this promise that God gives. And so God would put enmity or aversion, if you might think of it that way, between the serpent and the woman. He would also put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. That's one of the things that we saw and, and learned to read the Bible effectively, that these two strains that followed uh, throughout the Bible, from Genesis right through to Revelation, you have the seeds of the serpent and the seeds of the woman. And they quite literally butt heads. And so they're there. And so the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. In other words, annihilating it eventually. So that was the Adamic uh, promise. And the next one is that of the Abrahamic promise. And that occurs in a number of places, but probably the best place to start would be in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 8. And that one has got, depending on how you look at it, uh, it, it has a number of subsections, if you will. First of all, there was a national promise. Abraham's descendants would become a great nation. So all his seed, his descendants, including Abraham, would become this very powerful nation. The second point is that it was a personal promise. Abraham would become a great and powerful man. Along with this, he would inherit eternal life. There is the, the promise or the section or a part of the promise of a associative promise. So anyone that helped Abraham and the children of Israel would also be blessed by God. And, and that's something that we see right through to our day any of the countries or peoples that help the jews uh, they are helped by god and uh and so it's an associative uh, promise the last one is a worldwide promise and this part of the promise is how we become joint heirs of abraham's or the promises to abraham rather uh for us today, and, and that's very significant for us. And so through the prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ, both in his first advent and his second advent, we have, within that, we have the Abrahamic promise in the sense that the promise would be applied to all people. And if they believe that the, in the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and um, so, that's the Abrahamic promise. The next one is that of the Davidic uh, promise. And that's uh, in 2 Samuel 7. And it's a number of verses, uh, probably about through, uh, halfway through the chapter, um, 12 to 15, I think it is, something like that. And it does a number of things. And quite significant is this one. For what we're talking about this evening because it points forward 
to um, the Lord Jesus Christ in the fact of the son that is to come through David. And so just showing these. So the promise would be fulfilled after David's death. And so he didn't see it happen in his day. And so they haven't been fulfilled as yet, not all of them. And so they still look forward to the future. So in order for him to see him, see them rather, pardon me, he, he has to be resurrected in order to see those promises. So these promises came, uh, contained that his seed would, be, would rule over a kingdom. His seed would build a house for God's name. And his seed would be a king and kingdom lasting forever. So that last point, those two are, are very important for us this evening. The fact that the, the, his seed would be king on the throne and it would last forever. So we see um, both a, a number of things, which we'll come back to a couple times throughout it this evening. So his seed would be the son of David and the son of God. And again, we'll see how that works out. Uh, in future slides. So David will be present, present, pardon me, uh, to see these events. So he'll be there to see them happen in the future, in the future to our day even. And again, significant for us because we can become part of those promises that are given. And lastly, <clears throat> of these great uh, promises is that of the Christian promise. And that's contained in Galatians chapter 3, towards the end of the chapter, 26 to 29, I think it is. And uh, the promise explains how all families of the earth can inherit these same promises that uh, Abraham uh, and David received. They must believe the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So um, we want to talk, we don't have uh, a lot of slides, but we have a number of verses to look at. And so I'd like to look them up as best we can. And the first one, which is uh, really amazing when you think, of, you think of prophecies, sometimes we hear of prophecies in the world around us and they're, they're often couched in, in very, well, how can I put it? Uh, they're, they're couched in kind of strange and, uh, um, language is which isn't very exact or detailed but this one is and uh it becomes very useful so christ's first advent just talking about the word itself advent that means a coming into place to view or being arrival so when we talk about christ's first advent we're talking about his visible um visitation you might say his birth in this case later when we get to the second advent he will return to the earth and continue his uh the duties there as the king of the world <clears throat> so in isaiah 7 and 14 if we can read that now the book of isaiah is one of those major prophets uh after the book of psalms so if you were to take your bible and open it halfway uh you'd be roughly in psalms if you went forward towards the new testament a little ways you'll come to the book of <clears throat> isaiah isaiah is a huge prophecy um uh, 65 chapters something like that and this this verse that we're going to look at this uh, part of the prophecy of Isaiah was written approximately 2,000 years ago, or years in the future, pardon me, to when it was fulfilled. And, and the detail is truly amazing when you see it. So Ahaz at the time uh, was king of Israel, king of uh, Judah. If you remember from some of our studies and seminars we've gone through, um, the uh, children of Israel were in the land and they broke into basically two areas and uh you have you have the uh children uh the israel in the north and and uh judah in the in the south and so ahaz was king of judah 
I have King of Israel, but that's anyways, what that means is he was the southern king of the southern uh, group. Isaiah the prophet was told by God in a vision to tell Ahaz to ask God for a sign. So uh, if, you, if you can imagine Isaiah the prophet, he comes in to the king that was the reigning king at that time. And God has given him a vision to go and talk to Ahaz and ask Ahaz of God for a sign. <laughs> and what, what Ahaz says, and he says, no, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask for a sign. I'm not going to do that. And so Ahaz stubbornly would not ask for a sign. And so God says, well, I'm going to give you a sign anyways. And we have this in verse 14. And so if you have 7 and 14 open, it says, uh, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so th those are terms I'm sure you've heard before. You've probably heard of Emmanuel and in the New Testament. It's spelled a little bit differently, but it means the same thing. So the marginal reference, if you have a marginal reference, now this one is from my Bible and uh, it uh, takes me, if you look uh, on the screen there, there's a little I that's next to the word behold and uh, a virgin shall conceive and it takes me to the margin and it tells me it's cited in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. So this is one of the tips and the tools that we looked at in Learn to Read the Bible Effectively. It points out references in this case that are cited. It's a it's a quote in the New Testament from the Old. And so currently we're in the Old Testament and now we're we're going to go going to go to Matthew 1 and 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 starting at 23. So if you turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1, and I'll advance the slide while you're doing that. Matthew. <clears throat> okay. So in Matthew chapter 1, verses uh, 23 and 25, or 23 to 25, uh, we can see that there also is a cross-reference back to Isaiah 7 and 14. So when we were in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, it pointed us forward to the New Testament, and it says that it was cited in Matthew 1 and verse 23. <clears throat> so here is, uh, again, my... Uh, from my Bible, and, and we have at 23 here, so we're looking at Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, and, and that's where it says, Behold, the virgin shall uh, be with child. So it's a little bit different. You have to remember that in the Old Testament, it was Hebrew, and it was translated into English. And in the New Testament, it was Greek, and it was translated into English. So there, it's not always perfect. It often is very close, and it is here, too. A virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And it's, it's uh, spelt with an E instead of an I, for example, which being interpreted. Now, this is added uh, that this last part of the verse wasn't in Isaiah, but it says, which being interpreted is God with us. And so Emmanuel means God with us. And so if you were to bring up your, your, uh, uh, computer program, uh, eSword, or uh, online, or there, there's there's quite a number of them now uh, that you can use, <clears throat> and uh, it will show you the meaning of that word, uh, Emmanuel, and it will show you that it means God with us, and so this virgin would be, uh, would conceive and bring forth a son, and his name would be Emmanuel. Now, just uh, talking about uh, Bible marking uh, slightly, you'll notice I have another line up here um, in uh, verse 20, the end of 21, and it takes me down to a cross-reference, Acts 5, 31, and uh, Acts 13, 38. Now, we won't go there, but you can see what I've done 
to display it uh, and for me. So the next time I come here, I can look down and I can read that. And I said, oh, that's, that's a significant verse. And uh, I've also noted that where it has conceived in verse 20, it takes me to the margin. It says begotten. And, uh, and some of my chicken scratch there, which I, I don't know if you can read or not, but, um, that, that's for me. It's not really for you guys, but it's for me, uh, to, to when I get to this passage, I come to Matthew chapter one and I say, ah, yes, I remember that. We, we did, <clears throat> did some studies with that. Pam, could you get me a glass of water, please? <clears throat> Anyways. Okay, we'll continue. <clears throat> So there's another uh, clear reference. <clears throat> Damn, lose my voice. We hardly got into it. Then. <clears throat> um, first Advent. <clears throat> another clear reference is coming, coming of his coming is in Jeremiah 23. So if you could turn to Jeremiah 23. Thank you. I can read the passages for you, John, if that helps you at all. Yeah, please, uh, Bill. Um, so turning to Jeremiah chapter 23. Verse 5. Um, yes. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, so... A, a number of things there. We're, we're in, introduced here to a term that uh, runs through, throughout the Old Testament and that um, <coughs> and that is that of the branch. And so the Messiah is also referred to as the branch. So in the latter part of what Bill has just read, uh, I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And so what we can see from that is some of the fulfillments <clears throat> of the passages and prophecies that talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a good example. So also, if we skip down, um, Bill, if you go down to verse 17 of that same passage. <clears throat> okay, verse 17. Please. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord has said, ye shall have peace. And they shall say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Hmm. I think I have a wrong verse. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Anyways, let's keep going. Oh, verse 17. One of the passage that says that uh, David should never want a man to sit upon the throne, the house of Israel, which I thought was 17. Anyways, let's move on. <clears throat> so later in Jeremiah, if we turn to Jeremiah 33, and Bill, I'll get you to do this one as well, please. Jeremiah 33 and verse 15. Okay, well, verse 17 talks about that uh, same reference that you were talking about. So verse 15 says, in those days and at that time, I will cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Great. Thanks, Bill. Verse 17? or um, Yeah, sure. Let's read it. Okay. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Yeah, yeah that's the one I was after. Sorry, I had the wrong, totally wrong chapter. Chapter. Anyway, so later in Jeremiah, we see the the term Jeremiah that's used back in 23 and 5, 
and also in Jeremiah 33 and 15, I caused the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. And so when we saw that passage back in 2 Samuel 7, uh, which talked about um, the king that would be on the throne forever, it's the same branch, it's the same king, it's the same individual that it's talking about. So we have an echo back to David, as I've just mentioned, to 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 to 14. Now, <clears throat> if you remember, that's one of those four great promises that we did a bit of a review about when we first started this session. And that's the one that was the Davidic promise that was given to David. And it talked about the throne, uh, king to be on the throne, and it would last forever. Verses 12 to 14. Uh, yes, if you've got it, please. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Great. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so <clears throat> we, we have an echo, and we talked about echoes in the uh, Learn to Read the Bible Effectively, and we've talked about it in some of the other seminars that we've done last year. Echoes are very significant, but it's one of those things that you really don't catch on to um, until you've been working with the Bible for a while. You, you start and you might read a passage such as this, you know, read this uh, prophecy that's given to David and uh, that it would be, and, and you can read it and say, okay, well, it's going to be fil fulfilled after his death and, and go on, but he's actually going to see it. And you can maybe think about this. And then later you'll come across some of these other references such, such as Jeremiah 23 and 5, Jeremiah 33 and 15, which talk about the bran branch and it talks about <clears throat> this righteousness, the branch of righteousness to grow up under David. And so all of these become intermingled through those echoes. And echoes are a little easier to find if you've got a margin in your Bible, because the <clears throat> publishers of the Bible are the ones that have put in the marginal notes and references. And so it's not part of the, um, it's not part of the Bible, but it is a very useful tool to have. And uh, in my case, as you've seen in some of those other references, my marginal notes and references are in the middle. There's two columns going down the side and uh, you have the marginal reference in the center. But again, realizing that they, they, they are not part of the inspired word of God, but they are very useful tools for finding echoes and cross references and things like that. So let's turn to um, Isaiah 9, where we talked already, and Bill has read already, but if we could get him to read again, uh, Isaiah chapter 9. And verses Verse 6 and seven. 7. Yeah, please. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Great. Thanks, Bill. So again, we see these passages that are um, very useful, and very likely you'll have some of these uh, references as marginal notes. And as you read, you'll start to see the echoes between, sometimes between the old and new, sometimes between uh, passages in the Old Testament, for example. Now, we, we talked about, I think we come back to it here. Yeah, there, there's another echo 
about the branch, which I think is seeing how we're in Isaiah chapter nine. Bill, if you could go back to uh, okay. verses Isaiah, one to five, Isaiah one to nine or five, rather, please. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth its owner, and the ass its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Will you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick and the whole head, heart faint. Great. Thanks, Bill. So there, there's much there. What we see is that uh, during the time of Isaiah's ministration, it covered a period of, uh, what, three kings, four kings? And Ahaz, which we saw earlier uh, when we looked at that passage where um, Isaiah goes and, and tell, has the words from the, the Lord to ask of a sign, and he, and he wouldn't do it. But the sign was given, and that of the, the virgin birth. And so this section is, we see it uh, talking about the branch. So it speaks of this branch, which we, which we saw back in Jeremiah 23, and we also saw it in Jeremiah 33, and we, ha we saw it in an echo going uh, backward to 2 Samuel 7. So the branch does come up a number of times in, in our uh, scriptures of truth. So now I want to does reference it, John, in chapter 11, verse 1 as well. Please. Uh, please. It says, uh, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And then it goes on to talk about the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And it goes on as well. Great. That's perfect. So, so they, they all, uh, all those attributes, we know of the, the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. And so again, uh, when we talk about these advents, the first advent or his first coming, he came as the Lamb of God and he established who he was and he established that he was sinless. He never sinned throughout his entire life. And yet he was put to death by the Jewish rulers. And what it established for us is a, a vehicle in which we can seek to God. Uh, for forgiveness of, of the sins that we do commit, mistakes we make where we miss the mark, and we can come, and we do that through Christ, because he never sinned, and that's a very simplified form of that, but anyways, um, all these references to uh, the, the king, and that, and as Bill has just highlighted from this uh, chapter in Isaiah chapter 11, <clears throat> So the second advent, he comes as the king of the world. And that's going to entail a number of things. Um, he, he's there, I guess, one of the main things that he's, he's doing to start with will be judgment. And he will be there to purge out those that are full of sin, sinful, those that are cruel, those that are don't want any part of the new new kingdom of god to be established and uh, he just uh they don't want part of it so he comes as a judge but the second and probably the most important part of his job when he comes the second time as the king of the world is to rule in righteousness and he rules in righteousness there will be no more conflicts like we see every day you can uh it doesn't matter whether it's a magazine whether it's on the internet whether it's something that comes in the mail uh, uh you know like a leaflet or something they they're always talking about some sort of a conflict and it, it's just man's nature is to do that <laughs> and uh when christ returns he's going to do away with all of that 
and everything is going to be full of peace and righteousness. So in Daniel 2 and 44, we have a huge image, 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 image that stands up and uh, it uh, interprets as uh, the king, uh, kingdom to come. So um, maybe, Bill, if you could read that for us. Hey, verse and, 44. Uh, yeah, 44 and, and then 45 after. Okay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Great. Okay. So now again, what we're doing is we're looking at prophecies about Christ that are talking about his second advent. So not the one when he came as his birth and he grew up and he started his ministry for three three years and then he was taken and and crucified this is the second time and this will be in the future to us today so this is the second advent so in daniel 44 as we've seen earlier in the chapter it talks about uh the image that nebuchadnezzar had in a dream and he goes out to his wise men and says i want to know what this dream means and Daniel was the only one that could interpret the dream. And he makes it very clear to the, uh, the king that it was not him that was interpreting it. It was God. God was telling him what those images made that, or uh, were for. And so the dream was given by God to Nebuchadnezzar. And he gave to Daniel the interpretation. So Daniel makes it absolutely clear of what he's talking about. So there was this huge image of the various types of metals, and it, it had reference to the different kingdoms. And Skip last week went through some of this and, and talked about the different areas and, and peoples and that. So we won't go into that again, but just if you could read uh, 45, Bill. Okay. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. It's just those last couple of words. The dream is certain, and it's going to be put in place. It's going to happen, and that's because it was from God. And so we saw, and it talked about a little rock that hits the the bottom of the image and it destroys the whole image and I think and the and the rock grows and grows and it's the same concept it's the same idea of the branch that we saw in jeremiah and we saw in isaiah and, and that it's the same allusion to the same individual it's the lord jesus christ it's emmanuel it's the messiah it's all of them one and the same Now, in the Apostles' Day, uh, uh, he talks of the coming when Christ returns. And so if I can get you to read that one, Bill, this is in Acts chapter 17, towards the end of Acts, but not, I guess, maybe three quarters of the way through, something like that. Acts chapter 17. Verse 31. Please. Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Great. So just a bit of context. Um, this is the Apostle Paul. It's uh, writing at this point and or it, the, the context is talking about. And he's preaching on a hill in Athens. And uh, that hill is referred to as Mars Hill. And he sees there's all these altars, apparently. Uh, that are there and they're, they're they're to gods and they have the name of the god on it and, and what it's about but he he saw this one altar which said to the unknown god it was like oh well if we've for forgotten one of these gods we don't even know what his name is we'll just say it was to the unknown god and um, kind of kind of foolish i would think but anyways that's that's what it was and he he finishes after he talks about this this altar, he, he, he talks about those details in Acts 
31, which, uh, let me find it again, um, that uh, the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That man is the Lord Jesus Christ. That man is Emmanuel. That man is the Messiah. That man is the branch. They're all the same. So Christ's primary role, as we mentioned earlier, is to judge this corrupt and evil world. But he is also here to be a shepherd. And really, I guess you would say that's probably the, his main occupation, is to be a shepherd. We could change the term slightly and say the shepherd king he is. So now we're going to look at another example of his role. And this is uh, from... Ezekiel, and again, I'll get Bill to, uh, my uh, voice is just taunting at me here. To, okay, well, I'm going to read from verse 21, John. I think it has application as well. Okay, that's great. Okay, 21 to 24. And say unto them, to the nation of Israel, thus says the Lord God, because behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whether they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king unto them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned. And will cleanse them, so they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall all, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Great, thanks, Bill. So this section of Ezekiel's prophecy is uh, it, it's interesting uh, because it starts. Uh, it starts in chapter 36, and it talks about a transformed land and then a transformed people, the people that live in the, the land. And then it talks about transforming the nation itself and the government. So the section that Bill has just read from is talking about the transformation of the government. And then uh, in chapter 38, which I believe um, Skip touched on a couple of times last week, is... Uh, is further prophecies of uh, the time of the end and interesting set of passages. And so it's talking about the Jewish government that's going to be transformed. And it's an example of Christ's role, that of judging and shepherding his people. <clears throat> so Isaiah chapter two, what are you doing for time? Pretty good. Uh, Bill, again, I'll get you to read this one. Uh, you could actually read from uh, verse 1. It just gives a bit more context is all. Eight verses 1 down to verse 4. Please. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Wonderful passage. You know, this is one of these passages that become in in our own minds and memory as some of the significant passages that we understand and we we like. And it's one of those passages that, as you're learning to read the Bible, you come back to again and again and again. Like most of these passages about the advent of uh, and return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the prophet Isaiah is describing a time in the future after Christ's return. The world will be blessed with peace and tranquility, and that will be brought 
brought around because of the ministrations and rulership of the Messiah, Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the world united in one common worship, uh, responsible laws and a king ruling for a thousand years. And that's a thousand years is another total subject, which I won't even get into, but it's uh, very interesting to look into. So the phrase, the truth, and I, I use it, uh, I think, often. It is a biblical term. There is not... A, there is not a series of truths or many truths, as you sometimes hear. Sometimes when I've been talking to people and they will say, well, there's all kinds of truths. There's many truths. Or, you have a truth and, and I have a truth. And, and that's not true. There is only one truth. And we can see this um, exhibited from Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is in the New Testament. It's one of the letters of the Apostle Paul. And if I could get you to read that again, Bill, please. Starting from verse four to six, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Great. So it doesn't actually say the truth here, but what I'm emphasizing is, that there's all these one things and there is only one faith there is only one body one spirit etc and, and that's the same as the truth there is only one truth and uh it goes on so a couple other passages that we can look at which talks about the truth christ himself and i don't think we need to read these bill um but uh First of all, is in, in John 14 and verse 6, that's the, the uh, Gospel of John, and Christ re referring to himself, he says, I am the truth. And a little earlier in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, 32, it says, the truth will make you free. So they're talking about this concept of the truth and that there is only one. So for us today, the truth can only be found in the Bible, not in someone, what someone says or writes, and, and even what we, uh, as the people you're listening to, uh, say. So anything I say or Bill says, you want to compare it to the truth. You want to compare it to the Bible truth and make sure that it is right. So if, if we all do that, then we'll have the same truth, as it were. So another way to confirm everything is from the Bible, as I've just said. So, yeah. so some conclusions and um, uh, to think about. So the promise that is given to us today is that we can become heirs of the promises that are given to Abraham and his seed. And I'll get to Bill, if you could read that as well. Yep, verse 30, 26 to, 30, to 29 of uh, Galatians 3. Please. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. And it errs according to the promise. So there we, there we have it again. Those, those four great and precious promises that we uh, kind of reviewed from uh, other seminar sessions uh, come up time and time again. So here we are. The Apostle Paul <laughs> is writing to the, the uh, Ecclesia or church in, uh, in, in Galatia. And he's, he's saying to them, and talking about these concepts of Abraham's seed, and we can become part of his seed, or we can become heirs to the promises that were given to him. And so where he says in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond or free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. 
That's what's important for us today. And Christ is the vehicle. Christ is the way that this happens. <clears throat> now, Galatians chapter 4, just uh, the next chapter that we're in. Um, Verses 4 and 5. Please. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Great. That, that's how we become heirs according to the promise that was given to Abraham. We become adopted sons. And, and note how Paul has, has put it. He says, but when the fullness of time, and so when time had got to the point where the world uh, was ready and when the, the plan was to be executed as far as God's plan, he, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law and that we, we might receive the adoption of sons. So it's a huge subject, much larger than we can possibly cover this evening, but hopefully that will give you an idea about the Lord Jesus Christ and his role and what he was to do in his first coming and what he is to do in his second coming and how uh, particularly at this time of year in, in our country, we have this celebration of, of uh, Christmas, which is probably at the wrong time of year and, and everything else. They probably totally missed the, the impact of what they're trying to celebrate. But having said that, we can rest assured that Christ will return as the scriptures of truth tells us, and he will set up God's kingdom. So what God has said, he will do. And whether we're part of it or not, it's going to happen. Bill. Well, thanks, John. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, there's so many passages that point forward to the work of Jesus Christ. Now, this could only happen for two reasons. One is that God had the work of the Messiah in mind, in his plan, all along. And secondly, God's foreknowledge, his omniscience, or his all-knowing, would have seen the unfolding events, events coming out in such a manner that he could lay out things in absolute detail. We must remember that many of these passages were considered, that we've considered tonight and, and others as well, were written hundreds and in some cases thousands of years before the Messiah actually came. These passages are filled with absolute accuracy, even to the point where they were, for example, gambling for his garments at the base of the cross. And when we read Matthew chapter 27, verse 35, it says, they parted my garments and for my vesture did they cast lots. In other words, gambling. Well, take that back to Psalm 22, verse 18, and it says that they were, again, casting lots for his garments. It's just so detailed. And this was written at least 700 years before the, uh, the birth of Christ and the event that we're talking about. The word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than even a, a sh the sharpest sword in that it can cut us to the heart. It causes us to think carefully about what this is all about. And God has provided these um, foreshadowings and these prophecies as proof that we can have confidence as we worship him. So our next session on prophecy will be in two weeks, on January the 4th, I believe it is. So we're going to skip next week and carry on the week after. And we hope you can join us when Rod will have a look at some of the prophecies about the coming kingdom of God. Before we close, please join me as we conclude now with a word of prayer. Our gracious and almighty Father in heaven, we have seen the absolute detail of your word and the prophecies that were given, the, the foreknowing of your word to these men of old, as they were to look for these signs, so much so that 
even those men who came from the east looking for the star of David, we realize that they came because of the word that had been spoken during the time of Daniel. And there are many other prophecies like that where we can have confidence that you are in control. You've laid these things out and set a pattern, and you've appointed a day in which you will judge the world now in righteousness by that man, our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you have ordained and you've proven it by raising him from the dead. He now sits at your right hand, and we look forward to that time when he shall return again in that second coming, that second advent that we've talked about tonight. May we be strengthened in our faith, and we pray that you will keep us in your care. Help us to think upon these things carefully and to be prepared for the coming day of your Lord's return. We ask that you will hear us now, for we seek your blessing, giving you thanks for all that we've been able to enjoy and do together, for we ask it in his name. Amen.